Every now and then in the history of photography, there's been a product that probably can best be described as an inflection point, a uh, product which redefines what cameras are and what cameras can do. The Canon D30 is, I believe, a camera that will play a significant role in the changes that are taking place in still photography. And the reason for this is not so much the uh, price point, although that's very exciting, at under $3,000 US retail, which makes the camera much more affordable than the twenty and $30,000 uh, Kodak digital SLRs that pros have been using for a couple of years. But I think the most important thing and the thing that will help define it as one of the so-called inflection points in the history of photography is the image quality. I created quite a stir on the Luminous Landscape website uh, during the last week of October because I was one of the first people in the world uh, that got their hands on a production uh, Canon D30 and was able to do some comparative tests with film. The results were astounding. Uh, I'm convinced that in print sizes up to about 8 by 10, the D30 actually is superior to film. Uh, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a second. And using appropriate digital technology, prints up to anywhere in the range of the uh, prints on 13 by 19 paper uh, can be the equal of those from 35 mil. And very briefly, uh, what you'll see on the website in the comparisons that I've done is scanned Provia 100F, arguably the finest grain, sharpest 100 ISO film on the market, um, with a um, Emicon FlexTite scanner, uh, again, arguably uh, one of the finest desktop scanners available, and compared prints using an Epson 1270 inkjet printer, again, probably one of the finest desktop uh, printers, one that's used by many photographers and uh, uh, fine art uh, photographers uh, who sell their prints. Um, and the print comparisons were obvious to everyone who's seen them. The D30 produces luminous images. And we'll be looking at some of those uh, in a little while because there is something different about digital. And up until now, the difference about digital has been in uh, to the favor of film. Uh, digital didn't have the color quality, didn't, didn't have the uh, color saturation, didn't have the dynamic range, and certainly, of course, there's the area of resolution, which we'll talk about in a moment. One of the things that Canon has done that differentiates the D30 and makes it so interesting and also makes the image quality so special is the fact that they have used a CMOS chip as the imaging device. CMOS stands for Complementary Metal Oxide Semiconductor. And all of the digital SLRs up until now, and all digital cameras for that matter, use CCD chips. Uh, CMOS chips are less expensive to manufacture apparently, but more importantly, they're low voltage devices, which means that the imaging chip does not attract uh, static electricity the way that CCDs do and certainly uh, many Canon, uh, sorry, Nikon D1 owners of my acquaintance uh, complain bitterly about the problem of uh, dust on the imaging chip. This does not appear to be an issue with the Canon. As well, uh, the color saturation, dynamic range, and just generally the look of images from this chip uh, just seem to be more film-like. Uh, than those from CCD imaging devices. Um, I have no expertise in the technical area. All I can tell you is what I see in prints, and we'll look at those in a moment. And I think you're going to agree, and certainly everyone who has seen prints uh, from this camera uh, is taken aback by uh, the color quality, which is really quite remarkable. Uh, the camera is a 3.3 megapixel chip. Not much different in that regard than uh, many of the um, digital chips, digital cameras that are on the market during late 2000, early 2001. But what's important to realize is that the size of the chip is quite different. The um, less expensive point-and-shoot digital SLRs have very tiny uh, imaging chips. Uh, you'd be surprised if you saw their actual size. Uh, but the chip for the uh, Canon D30 is roughly the size of an APS frame. Um, and it's that larger size, even though 
the number of pixels is the same, which is the same uh, that helps, I believe, in creating uh, the superior image quality. Uh, a couple of things that need to be uh, borne in mind about the Canon D30. It's just another Canon camera uh, from the point of view of uh, using lenses, flash, accessories. Um, it's completely integrated into uh, the Canon EOS uh, system. What makes the camera different from any of the other EOS SLRs is the back. The back of the camera has a bright LCD screen uh, that you can use to review uh, the pictures that you've taken. Again, it needs to be borne in mind, this is an SLR. It's a single lens reflex. You take photographs not by looking at the LCD. It isn't a live chip. You take them through the viewfinder just as you would with any SLR and the rear LCD is simply for reviewing the images that you've taken. Uh, there is a histogram. You could, just as you see in Photoshop, you can see uh, the dispersion of uh, tonal values uh, across the spectrum from dark to light, uh, judge the quality of your image, uh, and also there is a menu function which allows you to do all of the things that you would expect in terms of altering um, various parameters within the camera. What you see attached to the bottom of the camera here is a, what is described by Canon as a vertical grip. Unlike other SLRs with uh, attachments like this, uh, which are typically motor drives uh, containing extra battery capability, there is no additional motor drive here. It is simply a container for um, the batteries that power the camera. One of the nice things that Canon has done is they're using the same batteries as are used. And these are lithium ions, which is a good thing. Uh, no memory effect and uh, a lot more power for the weight. Uh, but a couple of things uh, to notice are that the batteries are the same batteries that are used in a number of Canon's digital video cameras, which makes them very uh, readily available. Uh, secondly, uh, the grip uh, has place for two batteries and the camera is smart enough to run down the first battery and then automatically switch to the second battery. Uh, published tests seem to show somewhere around four to five to six hundred frames on a battery charge. So with two batteries in the grip you're looking at about a thousand frames uh, which is a pretty good day shooting. The charger that comes with the camera can charge two batteries. Uh, first it charges one, then it charges the other, then puts them on trickle charge. Again, a very uh, contemporary, intelligent system. But back to the, uh, to the grip, just like other battery grips or uh, motor drive grips uh, for Canon SLRs, um, there is a duplication of the controls. Now, I've got a 50 mil lens on the camera right now uh, and shooting a vertical is not that difficult, but when you have a long lens, the whole balance gets thrown off. So having a vertical grip means you have a shutter release uh, on the top. You also have the control wheel, and on the back, you have exposure lock and focus point um, selection, just as you do on the back of the camera normally. So taking a vertical, particularly with a long lens when your hand's going to be out here, uh, the balance works very well and uh, I strongly recommend that you get, if you get one of these, that you get the battery grip. Now, the camera doesn't use film. Well, what does it use? And the answer is it uses compact flash cards. Uh, these come in two forms. Uh, these are solid state memory cards and uh, you can also buy IBM micro drives. This incredible piece of technology is a one gigabyte memory card, uh, actually a hard disk from IBM. So 1,000 megabytes uh, can be contained on this hard disk and um, it's compatible with most uh, type 2 slots which are now appearing in most digital cameras and the difference between type 1 and type 2 is simply it's a little bit thicker than a type 1 card. But uh, Canon has uh, designed the camera from the start to utilize the IBM microdrives and I strongly recommend uh, that these be used. They contain this one gig card can hold something like uh, 
four or five times uh, the number of frames that can be taken uh, with a typical solid state memory card. Uh, on the subject of the IBM uh, microdrives, uh, they're very rugged. One need have no concern uh, about using them in the field. But um, I have been told by IBM one limitation is that they cannot be used above 9,000 feet. And the curious aspect there is that the drive actually uses air molecules between the head and the platter for the head to actually fly over. And above 9,000 feet, there aren't enough air, air molecules. So uh, a little bit of uh, trivia associated with this absolutely wonderful technology. So how do you get images from the camera into your computer? Well, several ways. The camera comes with a USB cable, so you can, and of course, matching software, so that you can uh, just physically attach the camera directly to your computer and transfer files. Uh, the second way is to take the compact flash card, whether it's a, um, a microdrive or a standard solid state memory, and plug it into one of these little adapters trying not to get lint from your pocket into the connectors. And now what you have is a standard, uh, what used to be called PCMCIA card, now called a PC card, which will go into just about every laptop ever made. Uh, in addition, the um, compact flash cards plug into uh, little adapters that attach to a USB port or a parallel port on your computer and you can transfer files that way, just the way you would copying them from uh, another hard drive or a zip drive. So lots of flexibility, lots of different uh, approaches to how uh, you use it. I should also mention that the camera can put out a video signal, both uh, North American NTSC as well as PAL, and so you can attach the camera directly to uh, any TV monitor uh, for viewing your uh, pictures. So if you're working in the field and you don't have a laptop with you and you find the small screen on the back of the camera uh, a little limiting in terms of doing a review of what you've shot, uh, if you're in a motel or a hotel room that has uh, a TV or a VCR with a monitor connector plug, a standard uh, video jack, uh, you can review your images directly from the camera on the TV set in your motel room. So a very flexible system. I want to talk about some of the advantages that I see. Now, I've said that the quality is as good as 35 millimeter. You can take that as, as an arguable point, but trust me, it's very, very good indeed. And of course, only going to get better because we're going to see higher resolution chips in, in the months and years ahead. But for me, this is a... Uh, a device that has some significance, a camera that will change the way I work. Uh, and it may have different implications and applications for you. Uh, I, I'm here at my uh, place in the country in northern Ontario, and I spend a good part of the year here, most of the summer. Uh, the nearest E6 film lab is about 100 miles away. So when I'm up here sometimes for three, four, five weeks at a time without getting back to the city, uh, I do a lot of shooting. I go out on the lake, I go in my boat, I go for hikes in the woods, uh, I shoot wildlife, I shoot landscapes, and I don't see what I'm shooting. Uh, typically when I go on a field shoot, um, I'm gone for three, four, five days, I'm back, I'm able to review what I have. The beauty for me is I can now work here in the country, take my frames when I come back from my shooting, put them in my laptop, have them up on the screen, print them out on my relatively inexpensive Epson 870 printer, and that, in fact, is what I did this morning. Just before filming this segment, I took a walk, and I took this photograph, and I now know what I have. Not only can I review the image quality on the LCD on the back of the camera, I can review it on my laptop, I can review it on this print. And this print is just about as good as the prints I can make back on my main desktop 
system back in the city. At the point that we're uh, taping this, I've had the camera for about two weeks. And I'm going to show you some of the prints that I've done, some of the images that I've shot uh, during that brief period of time. But uh, coming up uh, just within a couple of weeks, uh, I'm going on a major shoot to uh, central and northern Arizona, uh, including uh, Canyon de Chez, uh, the Bisti Badlands, hopefully uh, the um, uh, Antelope Canyon, Lower Antelope Canyon, and a few other locations. And uh, I am now confident enough in the quality that I'm getting from uh, the Canon D30 that this is going to be the primary camera that I take on the trip. So that's quite a vote of confidence. And uh, in a few minutes you'll uh, see some of the uh, results uh, from that shoot and in fact you'll see us on that shoot. Let me show you some of the photographs that I've taken in the last couple of weeks since I first got the Canon D30. Well, this is a photograph taken here at my place in the country in northern Ontario uh, and it's of a woodpecker just on a tree above my house. Um, if you look closely, uh, what you'll see is you can count the feathers on the bird. This was taken with the, the Canon uh, 100 to 400 IS zoom. It was handheld at 180th of a second and I was zoomed out to 400. Now, the imaging chip on the D30 is about the size of an APS frame. It isn't the full size of a 35 millimeter frame. So what that means is the focal lengths that you're using have to be multiplied by 1.6. So for example, this shot was taken at 400 millimeter on the lens, but because of the smaller image size of the chip compared to a 35 millimeter frame, in fact, I was shooting at the equivalent of 640 mil. So this to me is just a testament to uh, the quality of the imaging chip in the camera as well as something I've mentioned for uh, on a number of occasions and that is that wonderful image stabilization technology that Canon has. What I want you to notice in particular is the luminance of the out of focus background. This is something that there is a smoothness and a lack of texture. Uh, obviously, it's a lack of grain uh, because there is no grain in digital. And um, it just adds something that I've rarely seen in a film image. This photograph also shows the luminescent quality that the D30 is capable of. Uh, these transilluminated leaves, because there's a very strong backlight, um, just is um, very, very appealing and there's a richness to the greens uh, that I quite like. Uh, another interesting thing to note is on a number of these frames is the dynamic range. The range from very lightest to very darkest. Uh, there is detail in the shadows of this and some of the other images that I think, and I've done no scientific tests yet, but seems to me there is anywhere from a half stop to a full stop of additional dynamic range from the D30 over transparency film. These uh, sumac leaves, just photographed about uh, a week or 10 days ago when they were at their uh, peak color, uh, illustrate a number of interesting things. The color saturation is really quite special. Um, there is the reds and the greens and the transitions through uh, the various shades is, is very appealing and again color quality uh, that is different than film. I believe it's better than film but certainly different and certainly very appealing. Um, if you were to look very closely at this print, you would see the most amazing fine detail, even sort of the, the, the fine, and I don't know what the technical term is, the fuzz on uh, the stalks is, uh, is visible. Now, how do you get this to a print this size from an imaging chip that's 3.3 megapixels that's about the size of an APS frame? And the answer is that uh, a print like this needs a minimum of 240 dpi and 
these images are six by nine at that size. So to make a print that's bigger than six by nine, you have to do what's called resing it up, which is increasing the resolution. The most um, effective way of doing this is to use a program called Genuine Fractals Pro, and you'll see a full review of that product on the site. And what that product does is it effectively uh, allows you to make much bigger images uh, without uh, losing quality. It can't create information that isn't there, but what it does is it extrapolates the information uh, without degrading uh, the image quality, uh, which is what would effectively happen if you were to use, for example, uh, the uh, bicubic interpolation uh, that Photoshop uses when you increase uh, the size of, of an image from its original um, uh, pixel density. All of that aside, the important thing is, here we have an image that's roughly 12 by 15 or 12 by 16. That is about the biggest size that one can normally make from a 35 millimeter uh, frame before you start to lose quality. I don't think I've ever made a 16 by 20 that really held up to this kind of close examination. And the image quality here is as good as one could want. Let me also mention that this Almost all of these photographs were taken at ISO 400. And this to me is again one of the very exciting uh, aspects of the camera. Uh, the basic speed is 100. And that gives you the highest image quality. You can also shoot at ISO 200, 400, 800, and 1600. ISO 200 is almost identical to 100. Amazingly, ISO 400, two extra stops of aperture, uh, is virtually indistinguishable. Most of the prints that we've just been reviewing were shot. The originals were shot at ISO 400. And my shooting days go back to Tri-X uh, in the mid-60s at 400. And I now can shoot color at that same speed with image quality that is just about equal to ISO 100 film quality. So having the flexibility of just pressing a button, turning a wheel, and having multiple speed capability, multiple ISO speed capability in your camera without having to have uh, a separate body with slow and fast film, which is what I did for years when I worked as a photojournalist, that's tremendously exciting. And of course, with Photoshop, I don't need to shoot black and white. I can shoot color and use channel mixer uh, to get a variety of um, filter effects that I would if I was shooting black and white. And again, refer to the site and you'll see uh, the section on how to use channel mixer to do really remarkable uh, black and whites from color originals.